Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar series, Challenges of Expanding Access to Health Products in Fight Against Neglected Tropical Diseases. This webinar is organized by Japan Alliance on Global Neglected Tropical Diseases, JAG NTD, and sponsored by Global Health Innovative Technology Fund, GHIT Fund. My name is Kota Yoshioka. I am assistant professor at the Institute of Tropical Medicine, Nagasaki University. And it's really nice to have you all in this webinar series. Today, we have more than 100 people listening to this session. Thank you for coming. And let me start with two housekeeping issues. So first, please switch your language between English and Japanese by clicking on the globe symbol in your Zoom screen. The second, please post your questions anytime during the session by clicking on the Q&A button. You can post your questions anonymously and you can write your questions either in English or Japanese. We have a Q&A session after the lecture. Well, now let me talk about this webinar series. This webinar series is designed to discuss access to health products in the field of NTDs. Over 1.7 billion people around the world are affected by NTDs and many, many, and many of them are left undiagnosed or untreated. So why? In part, it's because there are no diagnostics or medicines for some entities. But even when we have good products, these products often fail to reach people who need them. Let's take COVID-19 vaccines as an example we observed incredibly quick development of new vaccines. But we are failing to distribute these vaccines across countries. People living in low income countries have no access to good vaccines. And from this COVID-19 example, we can learn that there is no success without access. And this lesson applies to NTDs. There is no point in developing a new vaccine or new medicine if we fail to deliver it to the affected people. Through this webinar series, we will look into key access challenges for NTDs and discuss how these challenges can be overcome. Good. So I would like to introduce my co-moderator, Dr. Isaac Chikwana. He works at the GHIT Fund as a Senior Director for Investment Strategy, Access and Delivery. So Isaac-san, please introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, Yoshioka-san, for the introduction uh, to myself, to GHIT, and to the webinar series. Uh, as your Shoka Sang has already explained, uh, I'm Isaac Chikwana. I'm the Senior Director of Access and Delivery at the Global Health Innovative Technology Fund. So the Global Health, or GHIT as we call it, GHIT is an international public-private partnership uh, that funds research and development of health technologies for neglected tropical diseases. By health uh, technologies, we refer to diagnostic tools, vaccines and medicines. So this session, uh, GHIT does not uh, invest directly into access, but uh, one way we support uh, access is to work with other organizations like uh, JEG NTD and other stakeholders that are involved in access. So my role at GHIT is to connect our product development partners uh, and our innovators to the various uh, access stakeholders that might be involved in the access work related to their products. So this is the first session uh, of seven sessions we'll be having every month until March uh, next year. 
Uh, there are many different challenges to access, as Joshua Sang has said. So probably in the seven sessions, we won't be able to cover everything, but hopefully we'll be able to share some insights and maybe discuss some possible solutions to some of the challenges in the next few months. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I'll take you back to Joshua Sang to introduce more of this of today's session, and then we can proceed with our key presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. So let's start our first session. This is one of the seventh session. Today, we want to clarify concepts of access. So what does access mean? What kind of factors may shape access? And how can we improve access in theory and in practice? We try to answer these questions today. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, Professor Michael Reich. He's a professor emeritus at Harvard Chan School of Public Health. The Professor Reich is a political scientist working in global health for decades. And he was my academic advisor when I was a doctoral student at that school. And he is also helping JAG NTD as advisor. Professor Reich will talk about his book on access to health technologies. It's over to you, Professor Reich. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Yoshioka-san. Nihon no minasan ni ohayo gozaimasu. 私はハーバード大学のライスと申します。よろしくお願いいたします。I um, I will today uh, be speaking in English. It's a great pleasure to be here as the first in this important series with JAG NTDs and the sponsorship uh, of GHIT. Um, and I actually have had a relationship with GHIT uh, from its first days and had the pleasure of observing its growth and its positive impacts around the world. So let me uh, bring up my screen and uh, share with you some slides. Is that OK? Yes, that's fine. Good. So um, as, uh, as Yoshioka-san Yoshio said, I'm going to give you an introduction to thinking about access and particularly a way for analyzing access and on ways of thinking about strategies to improve access with some concrete examples. So there is a growing re realization around the world that uh, just because you come up with a good health technology doesn't mean that it will be delivered or that it will achieve its potential in health gains. As, as Yoshioka-san said, uh, the current global pandemic has many examples of this. There are many multiple causes for limited access, and those have to do with market failures, government failures, and non-government agency failures. So the, the talk that I'm going to give you today is based on a book uh, that was published in 2008. Uh, this was done with Laura Frost, um, co-authored with her on how do good health technologies get to poor people in poor countries. There is a Japanese translation which appeared in 2017, um, although the title in Japanese is Iakuhin Access the content is actually broader than uh, just pharmaceuticals. And the book is available for free. As when we wrote the book, we said, how can we write a book about access and not give people access to the book? Uh, the book was sponsored by the Gates Foundation. Take a look at the book. In, in the book, we reviewed the processes of health technologies introduction in low and middle income countries. 
We created an analytic framework for understanding the complex factors in health technology innovation that affect access. And we applied the framework to a series of case studies that related to some of the major priority areas for the Gates Foundation. Um, what I'm going to do is describe some of the contents and then some of the lessons that we reached in the book. We considered four main factors that create access. Architecture, which has to do with how do organizations relate to each other and how are they structured? So the architecture of organizations, Questions of adoption, this has to do with demand factors and acceptance by individuals, by providers, and by agencies. Affordability, so cost questions, both for patients, for providers, as well as for governments. And finally, some questions of availability, which has to do with supply, including production. It's important to note that when we think about access, it's not just physical access, but it includes whether a product is used correctly. This is the framework that we came up with, and it's used to identify barriers, facilitators, and key actors for access planning. So the, the framework involves the four A's. It involves our definition of access as the dependent variable, what you want to improve an assessment of the key actors under each A, an assessment of the barriers and the facilitating factors, and then finally coming to what can you do? What kinds of strategies exist for specific actors to overcome barriers and facilitating factors? We sought to develop a framework that was both analytical, in other words, something that can explain why access happens or doesn't happen, but also something that was actionable, that would lead to specific actions to help solve a problem. Most people think about access as a kind of linear process, and this is one of the models that exists of access as a linear process, but things don't always follow this way. And in the book we wrote, products do not fly off the shelf on their own. So they need to be driven. Access is something that you create, and it's something you create by explicit strategies. In the book, we did six in-depth case studies, um, and we looked at different kinds of health technologies. And, and these are similar to the kinds of technologies that we would see discussed now for COVID. Medicines for treatment, vaccines for prevention, diagnostic for telling whether someone is infected or affected, devices related to those different technologies, and preventive technologies, both contraceptive as well as dual protection technologies. Let me just quickly show you the pictures of those technologies. So this is the medicine that we looked at. It's a medicine called Praziquantel used for the treatment of schistosomiasis, an infectious disease. We looked at the hepatitis B vaccine, including its development and the factors that led to its access. We looked at some of the factors that both created a rapid diagnostic for malaria, as well as some of the complicating factors that have made access difficult. In Norplant, we looked at both successful and unsuccessful factors. The vaccine vial monitor is a very neat device for telling whether a vaccine vial has been exposed to heat. And finally, we looked at the female condom, which protects both against, against infectious diseases and against pregnancy, which has not been very successful. So these case studies were retrospective analyses. They were stories trying to explain what happened why something was successful or not successful in producing access. In each case, we looked at financing, we looked at actors, we also looked at political factors. They were qualitative and contextual historical narratives. And we organized them around what we call the access favors, phases. In each case study, we tried to answer 
what happened in the process of creating access. And we use them to illustrate how to use the access framework in analysis. For each case study, we produced a table like this, where the columns were barriers, strategies, and specific actions. There are many other case studies by other researchers that are using this framework. So the framework has been around now for just a little bit more than 13 years, and it's had all sorts of applications. One professor used it in a course on access to medicines where the students split up into small groups and they use the framework to write final papers on specific health technologies. You can see many aspects of the access framework in the current COVID-19 pandemic, exemplified by the problems of the vaccine program globally that has not had much effect in low income countries, but it's also related to problems of masks in the United States, as well as the personal protective equipment. Here's a recent paper that I wrote with um, some Japanese colleagues at Harvard on access to HPV vaccination in Japan. It's just been published. And if you're interested, please take a look at the link. So here are the key findings. Developing a safe and, effective, safe and effective technology is necessary, but not sufficient for ensuring technology access and improvement. We found that end user adoption, how do the people who are supposed to use it, how do they feel about the technology is an important and overlooked component. Creating access thus depends on effective product advocacy, including a good coordinating architecture, product champion, and access plan. Cost is important, and it requires strategies to address affordability, but you also need strategies to assure the availability for physical access, and you have to have efforts to scale up access. You have to invest in health systems if you want to scale up access. Um, as a follow-up to the book, we examined the kinds of research studies that are needed in an access plan, and we identified 13 different types of research studies. Here's the link. Here's the list. So uh, what are the conclusions? Creating access for new health technologies is not easy, but it can be done and it does happen. It requires attention to the processes of agenda setting and implementation at the global level, but also at the national level and subnational levels. It requires strategies to manage imperfect markets and imperfect governments. And you can use this strategy to design, use this framework to design strategies that can actually improve access to good health technologies in poor countries. Um, I'm going to turn over now to uh, Dr. Yoshioka, and he's going to present a specific example based on this research article that he wrote while he was at Harvard. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you this morning. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Reich. I think your presentation clear, clarified the concept of access. Now we are very clear how access is defined and how to think about access. So now I will be giving an example of using access framework based on my doctoral project. Let me share the screen. So I will present my doctoral project as an example of how to use the access framework. And uh, I will talk about my 10 month doctoral project in 10 minutes. So that is my challenge today. And the topic is about access to benzene soul 
a medicine for treatment of Chagas disease. And my study targeted one of the high income countries in the world, the United States. The Chagas disease is one of the neglected tropical diseases. Its parasite is mainly transmitted by kissing bags and it can damage seriously our organs, including heart. And in the world, about six to seven million people are infected, mainly in Latin American countries. Now for treatment of Chagas disease, we have two kinds of medicines, benzonidazole and nifurtimox. And they are not easy to use drug. They can be very effective to treat some Chagas disease patient, but they can be even dangerous for other patients because of severe side effects. My study focused on benzonidazole which is considered to be a first line drug in the United States. So this is an introduction to my study. In the United States, 300,000 people are estimated to be infected with the parasite of Chagas disease, mainly because of the migration from Latin American countries. And among them, only less than 1% were diagnosed and treated. So I can say that access to benzonidazole was very limited in the United States too. And we observed important events. In 2017, the US FDA approved benzonidazole for children. And the next year, benzonidazole went into the market so I was motivated to investigate access after this change in regulatory approval and supply chain. And in my study, I had two purposes. The first one is to identify factors shaping access to benzonidazole after commercialization. And the second one is to suggest strategic actions to expand access. Put simply, I try to answer the question, why access to benzonidazole is so limited in the United States and what we can do to solve it, to expand access. So I first adapted the access framework. The original framework presented by Professor Reich was developed for low and middle income countries. So I needed some adaptation to apply it to the United States. Just for example, look at affordability stream. I put Exceltis USA. This is a pharma company that commercializes benzonidazole in the United States. Often in this country, pharma companies cover part of the drug cost in order to provide drugs at low cost or for free to disadvantaged people. So a pharma company can be an important actor in affordability stream in the United States. But a pharma company is not presented as a payer in the original access framework. And you can observe other adaptations too. Just briefly about the method. I used multiple data sources, including literature review and the interview and the commercial database from the company. And I relied on a deductive approach to identify access barriers and facilitators. Now, both data collection and analysis were guided by the access framework. And I don't go deep into methods because of today's time constraints. Look at, let's look at some key findings. In architecture stream, I found two important networks working for Chagas disease, but there was no national level network 
to coordinate actors working in public, private, medical, and academic sectors. The challenge is to create a mechanism of coordination and communication among different sectors. Availability. Availability is about how to move the drug produced in Spain to the mouth of patients living in the United States. I found one big barrier within the United States. Some physicians didn't know that there was a specific order form that was prepared by Exceltis USA. The physicians didn't submit the order form to the company and failed to get benzenidazole. Another barrier in this stream was a lack of a rapid delivery system. In some special circumstances, patients need to get benzenidazole as soon as possible, but the company, Exertis USA, was not prepared for that demand. Now, in affordability stream, I found that drug price was not a key access barrier because Exertis USA and the health insurance schemes largely covered its cost. The key barrier was the out-of-pocket expenses, but not for drug, but for other medical services, such as serological tests, several physician visits, and electrocardiogram. This barrier played a significant role for uninsured patients because they can be required to pay 100% for all the services. And the acceptability or adoption stream was the most problematic one. Among several barriers, I found that only a small number of physicians could offer treatment of Chagas disease. One patient side, on patient side, sorry, they often struggle to make several medical appointments because it is difficult for them to accommodate job requirements or child care duties. These barriers affect negatively demand for benzenidazole. Appropriate use was a part of adoption stream in the original framework. I separated it from adoption to make clear argument about appropriate use of benzenidazole. Before prescribing benzenidazole, a physician needs to determine if his or her patient should take this medicine. But not all physicians were aware of it. And my study captured one case in which a physician tried to prescribe the drug without performing necessary examinations. Putting these findings together, I devised some recommendations. There are six areas of strategic action for the pharma company, Exceltis USA. And there is one more action point to expand the US Chagas network, which addresses the barrier identified in architecture stream. These suggested actions, if taken, can contribute to expanding access to benzenidazole in the United States. As conclusions, my study identified nine access barriers and seven areas of actions to overcome those barriers. The access framework is very useful, not only to analyze access, but also to propose actions. And if you are interested in my uh, published version of my study, please take a look. And most importantly, this slide. So my study ended when I submitted my dissertation and I submitted the paper. But then what happened? And just a few months ago, there was a workshop on this topic in the Harvard Chan School. And we could observe some important progress. 
for example, a Shargas net provider network was established to strengthen communication among health providers and experts. The pharma company's financial assistance program has been sustained, so affordability is secured. And an express delivery system for emergency cases has been developed. And I hope that we can observe more positive changes in the next years so that benzenazole can be more accessible to the patient living in the United States. So that's all, thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Yoshoka-san, for the presentation. And thank you very much, Professor Raj, for the presentations as well. Uh, very insightful uh, discussions. So um, I'll be uh, following the, I've been following the Q&A uh, sessions, uh, Q&A questions that are coming in. We have a lot of questions. So myself and uh, Nishimura-san will be uh, forwarding some of the questions to the panelists. Uh, unfortunately, my Japanese is not that good. I can't read <laughs> the Japanese uh, questions, uh, but Nishimura-san will be helping. Uh, but maybe just to start us off, uh, I'll start with a provocative question, uh, uh, probably to Professor Raich, uh, and maybe Yoshoka-san, you can also add on. So um, if you look at the, the conceptual access framework that you've uh, presented, if I were somebody who was new to, to the access world, I could imagine that access starts at manufacturing. But we know that there's a, there are a lot of processes that go on be, before a product actually exists, you know, like the research and development uh, that goes in. It also has an impact on access. Where would you put those uh, processes uh, in your access framework? Maybe we start with Professor Raich. Good. Thank you, Isaac. Um, I've also had a chance to look at some of the questions in the in the Q&A, and, and I'd like to thank everyone for their very interesting comments and questions. Um, with regard to this point of where does access fit into the R&D process, um, we actually argue that access needs to be thought about throughout the entire process. So from the beginning point of even coming up with molecules, thinking about which diseases do you work on um, at the point of where you have, where you're showing some positive activity, again, to begin working with other departments, for example, in a company, and also to begin thinking about the implications of coming up with technologies. I think one of the things that's happened in the pharma world in the last 30 years is that private companies have been giving more attention for a variety of different reasons to questions of access and to the development of health technologies for people in low and middle income countries. So, um, you know, it, it and, and that includes companies in Japan. It really requires a change in the mindset of people, both in the development of products, um, as well as in the basic research, as well as in marketing and sales. So I don't know, Isaac, if you would like to comment on that from your perspective as well? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. You, uh, it's, I, I think you, you answered uh, the question when you said that we, the access should start from the beginning, the conception of uh, product development. And this actually is part uh, answer to another question we have in the question and answer where it's actually directed to Jihit about how Jihit ensures access to to, to the products. And uh, going back to what you've said, one of the things that GHIT does is to really engage with the, the, the grantees, you know, the product developers and the innovators who, get, who benefit from GHIT funding. 
right from the beginning during the R&D process to ensure that they are already starting to think about access. They're thinking about uh, intellectual property. Uh, where are the barriers to, to the product? They're thinking about the pricing. Is the pricing matching the target market? They are thinking about manufacturing. Where is the product going to be manufactured? Uh, and how is it going to be procured? And how is it going to be delivered? So all these things should really start from the from the conception of the product and go on being developed throughout the uh, the research and development process. So this is one of the things that we we do at GHIT with the products that uh, uh, that are funded by GHIT. The other thing that GHIT does also uh, is to work with the product developers as they develop their launch strategies or their go-to-market strategies. Also, we, we ensure that they have looked at all these processes, all the steps to access uh, on manufacturing, IP, pricing, and all these things before a product actually reaches market. Uh, so it, it really goes to, to what you've mentioned. I don't know if uh, yoshoka Sang, you have anything to add from your experiences with Chagas? Uh, not from my experience of Chagas, but yeah, I agree that the access planning should be started as early as possible. But the always the question is how early, when to start the access planning? So sometimes I talk to the company people in all the, around the, the process, and uh, I say, you know, access planning is very important. You, you should start it. Maybe you can start it right now. But they said, well, I understand it, but you know, my product, the candidate product is still, it's, a, it's too early. And we are not sure if my candidate will be a product or we can sell it. So I'm, there is a huge uncertainty. Agreed, thank you. But uh, I would say it's never too early to start uh, talking about access. For example, if you're thinking about pricing, you don't have to have an exact price for your product, but you need to know the market. Uh, if you're going to be selling, uh, uh, for example, one of the products that uh, uh, GHIT is, is funding, uh, which is a pediatric version of the price that was presented by Professor Reich, you know your target market. Uh, your target market is mostly low income, least developed or poor countries. Uh, and the, the patients themselves probably cannot afford and they rely on support from government programs or uh, implementing organizations, donor organizations. So if you already have that in mind, it can help you as you develop the product, maybe in the, you know, in the components you put in the, in the medicine, it can help you look for the right affordable components. So I would say it's never too early, even if you don't think the product is going to make it to market. So we can go to the next question. Uh, Nishimura-san, would you like to help I, us? I think, yeah. I think Sorry, Professor Raj have, uh, have a comment. Yes. Go ahead, Professor Raj. Thank you. So I wanted to uh, respond to two of the questions in the chat, which I think are really important questions. Um, first was a question, well, someone said, well, what do you mean by imperfect markets and imperfect governments? And that's a good point. This is actually, there's a huge literature on what's called market failures and also government failures. And, um, and I would encourage you to take a look at that. Some of that is referred to in a book of mine called Getting Health Reform Right. But the typical problems in market failures are part of it's called information asymmetries the buyers, the consumers, don't have enough information about a product in order to make a reasonable choice, whereas the producers have that information and that affects a whole range of decisions and choices so that people don't know always what they're buying or what they should buy. Um, there are also classic monopoly failures in markets so that markets don't act. Some of those Monopolies are intentional, as in intellectual property, for limited periods of time uh, in order to provide incentives for developing new products. But those are effectively market failures. Markets are not acting as perfect competitive environments. Um, government failures, we can think about in terms of the failures of governments to identify important collective problems for government action. We can think about government failures in not 
designing effective public policies. And we can think about government failures in terms of inabilities to implement. And again, if you think about the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic globally right now, there are lots of examples of both market failures and government failures in what the world has been experiencing. Um, the second point, which again was raised by a couple of people, was uh, the issue of how do you generate social trust in a technology, especially new technologies, and um, particularly in the current global environment of social media and, and information that spread quickly, that basically makes it difficult to assess the truth value, whether something is true or not. And the tendency for people to believe things that are not based on scientific studies or uh, based on fears or based on what they read in the internet or Twitter. So this is, this is a really serious problem. Um, and it's one that I think calls for more effective policies and strategies by governments to manage perceptions around technologies, around vaccines, around medicines. And um, again, I would urge people, if you want to look at specifics, take a look at the paper that I did on the HPV vaccine Japan. in Japan. It has a number of specific recommendations for different groups for rebuilding social trust in a vaccine that has had a dramatic experience in, in Japan since 2013. Good. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Yoshoka-san, uh, sorry, Nishimura-san, do you have uh, a question you would like to ask? Yes, here's this question. Given the deep rootedness of social norms and the plurality of information sources, including infodemics, the current infodemics, what steps could have been or should be taken in the future to lead to practices that will withstand use by users? What are some of the examples of failures that you show in your book? So I think that um, both governments and companies and NGOs need to develop more effective means for managing the infodemics, the spread of information that is not accurate. Maybe what's really required is better training on what constitutes science, not only in elementary schools and high schools, but in colleges and continuing education in science. Um, I, you know, I think this is just a reflection of the complex world that we're living in now. There, there, there always have been fears about technology. I recently wrote an article about the past 150 years of social responses to vaccines in Japan, starting with what happened in the late Tokugawa period when the Janarian smallpox vaccine was first brought into Japan. So there are roles for both governments and medical associations for helping to manage the popular perceptions of health technologies that I think needs to be developed and used more effectively in Japan. Thank you, Professor. Uh, the questions are coming in thick and fast. So there's a question that is uh, related to communication, to infodemics, to information that, you, uh, that we've just been talking about. So this one I'll direct it to Yoshoka-san. So there's, uh, it starts with a comment like, creating access requires attention to processes. So this includes smooth and reliable chain of information going through developers, policymakers, healthcare professionals, and community. How does uh, GHIT and JAG-NTD work 
in this communication area. So over to you first, Yoshoka san. Well, um, that's a very tricky question because I think the effective communication, what is effective communication is depending on the kind of a product, if it's a back vaccines, vaccines is for prevention, or if it's medicine for treatment, I think we need a different ways of a communication. And um, at the JAG NTD, we are not currently involved in any access processes. So we are trying to gather uh, many people working in the field of NTDs and uh, study collectively about access, but we are not uh, doing any specific project uh, to, to distribute information about NTD technologies. That is my answer. Okay. Uh, thank you. So from the GHIT uh, side of things, we, we, we totally agree that uh, the flow of information, uh, communication is very essential. So one of the things that uh, uh, GHIT does and, uh, is we, we work through this platform called Uniting Efforts for access, uh, for access. So you can find more information uh, uh, online or if you just type in Uniting Efforts. So it's a platform uh, uh, created by the uh, between shared by GHIT and UNDP Access Development and Access Development Partnership ADP, and it's funded by the Japanese government. And the whole essence of this platform is to bring together stakeholders. So it's stakeholder engagement is to bring stakeholders involved in the uh, in the whole process from the innovators, the funders, the communities, countries, the WHO including JAG NTD is also part of this, uh, this community. And really the idea is to have everybody sitting down sort of around the same table and we discussing the challenges uh, we're facing on access and how we can uh, deal with them together, not just uh, innovators coming up with solutions or communities coming up with solutions or governments coming up with solutions or the WHO coming up with solutions. I think it has to be that uh, communal effort to, for uh, for a community of purpose. So I think that's one of the the the, the key uh, pieces of uh, work that can go into improving the communication and information flow. Professor Rice, do you have anything to add to that? Okay, <laughs> thank you, uh, Nishimura-san. There is one interesting question to everyone. Um, this person wants to ask, why, what made you interested in access? So um, let me start. I think that's a, a really important and interesting question. Understanding the motivations for why people study things. Because, you know, you only have a limited amount of time to work on things. So it's important to choose things that are important. One of the first technologies that I worked on actually in the mid 1980s was praziquantel, the treatment for schistosomiasis. And, and it was to help someone who was an expert in schistosomiasis answer the puzzle of why is it that this good and effective treatment, this medicine for schistosomiasis is not available in a specific African country. So it, it was a puzzle. It wasn't expensive, but still it wasn't available in the markets. It wasn't available in the government health facilities. And really since that time, I've been interested in the question of how can we make good health technologies more available to poor people in poor countries, people who don't have the resources to buy good products? The book that I did with Laura Frost was really started by someone at the Gates Foundation who was concerned um, in the mid 1990s, late 1990s, that the Gates Foundation was spending too much time 
developing technologies, thinking that they would somehow make their way to people who need them without giving attention to how does that happen. And so we started the book to try to help them answer the question of what is it that explains why some good technologies end up being widely used and effective and others that seem like good ideas don't end up with that wide use. And I think this is a classic public health issue. When markets fail and when governments fail, how can we actually design strategies to get good health technologies to the people who could benefit from them in ways that don't require huge amounts of money. Thank you. Uh, Yoshoka san, your comment on why yeah. you became interested in access? Yeah, um, simply because I started my career in rural communities in Guatemala. So I watched the lack of health products, lack of medicines in the field. And then when I went to the Harvard Chan School and I talked to Professor Michael Reich, I was just surprised because I realized that access can be studied. So to me, access was something ambiguous. It's not a topic of research, but he said this can be studied and uh, you can do a doctor project. And I did it. Thank you. Uh, so so uh, as for me, I think it's, it's also from personal experience. Uh, I was uh, trained as a medical doctor in uh, Zimbabwe, where I'm from. And I was trained at a time when uh, HIV was really wreaking havoc in the late 1990s. And medicines were starting to come into the market, but they were only for, for the rich and famous. They were not affordable. And uh, yet the, the, the burden of the disease was mostly in the developing world where uh, I was working for example. So that uh, sort of sowed the seeds for access uh, to be. And uh, ever since I've been uh, sort of working towards more public health oriented uh, medical career and focusing on really trying to improve access to, to, to health technologies for the, 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 the most vulnerable members of the community. But I think uh, I can sum up the, the, you know, the, the interest in access with a mantra we have at GHIT that medicine is valueless uh, with uh, with without access so if you you can have all the fancy products you want and if they are on shelves then and they're not benefiting the people who need them then they're useless you might as well not have the products so i think that that's why there's this uh, interest in making sure that whatever products we have are accessible to the people who need them so there's another question that's sort of uh uh it's it, uh is connected to what uh, Professor Wright just mentioned uh, at the end of uh, the, the, the last comment, but I don't think we have enough time to discuss that, but I'll just read the question. The question is really, it's, we have talked about market failures, we've talked about government failures, so what can be done to, to, to improve the system? But I think this, uh, this will need another session on its own. We are left with uh, five minutes uh, on this one, but maybe just uh, Professor Wright, you can just throw in one last word on that, what can sure. be done? So Isaac, I saw the same question. I thought that's a really interesting question. What do you do when you're confronted with market failures, government failures, and civil society failures? And so um, my answer there is you have, what you need is creative thinking. Okay. I, 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 I think that even those kinds of puzzles can be solved but it requires thinking about political dimensions, social dimensions, psychological dimensions, perceptual dimensions. And, and it requires thinking about one of the most interesting questions is, when is it that relatively powerless groups can have influence on public policies and public decisions? 
And, and, and I think there are strategies and there are mechanisms to do that. And um, I'm, I, I, I'm not gonna say, read my book and it will give you the answers, but I think there are at least some hints in there of things to think about um, in coming up with strategies to change how people think about problems and what people do about problems. Thinking outside the box. Thank you. Um, uh, Yoshoka-san, your last comment, and then uh, I will hand over to you to close the session. Okay, thank you, Isaac. So my comment to that question, how to fix many failures, um, comes, from, comes from the example of Chagas disease. So now in the field of Chagas disease, there's a lot of effort to organize patient associations. And these are invisible people. They are not um, considered by the government many times, but they organize themselves and they want, they try, they are trying to deliver their own voices uh, through WHO or any other uh, official agencies. And this could be a very important step to address that kind of failures. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Reich and uh, Dr. Yoshoka for your presentations and your comments. There are still many questions coming in. So uh, I'll let uh, uh, Yoshoka-san explain uh, what will be the following steps to respond to some of these questions for those that we could not address uh, today in this session. Yoshoka-san. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. And uh, it's time to close our webinar session. So today we reviewed the key concepts and uh, the definitions around access and discussed how we can use the access framework for access planning and to solve access problems. So we will use these concepts and ideas that we learned today throughout our webinar sessions. So again, I thank our guest speaker, Professor Michael Reich, and uh, I thank all of you who joined today's session. Just uh, information, a recorded version of today's session uh, will be available on the JAG NTD's website. And they will also try to answer the question that we can take today. And I hope I can see you again in our next session in October. Our session two, will examine access challenges of a new medicine for treatment of African sleeping sickness. More details of the session will come soon on the JAG NTD's website and please stay tuned. So see you then. So thank you very much. <laughs>